Uh, very excited to have you all. Um, this is a session about water resilience uh, from diagnosis to delivery, particularly focusing on uh, urban water systems, so at the city scale. Uh, my name is Fred Boltz. Uh, I've had the honor of working with the teams that have developed this approach over the past couple of years. Uh, I'm affiliated with the Resilience Shift that is now one of the major funders of the work. Uh, I'm also on the steering committee uh, of the work with uh, the World Bank, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, OECD, CWI, Arup, great team of people. Uh, we've had the good fortune of uh, many cities working very closely with us to develop this approach. We'll be featuring some of them today. Uh, the work was piloted in eight cities and we'll feature uh, just a few of them today, but really terrific work, really filling a critical gap in knowledge in how to diagnose and design for urban water system resilience. Uh, that's me. And, and why urban water system resilience and, and what's the, the urgency that we face? Um, as noted, the climate is changing. We're not keeping a pace with the changes that are, that are occurring. And, and effectively, humanity faces two urgent imperatives in order to thrive under climate change. The first is to sustain an Earth system that's suitable for humanity to thrive. So to maintain the natural ecosystems, ecosystem services, and their ability to adapt to change. And the second imperative is to build the resilience of human systems, agricultural systems, energy systems, cities, and economies, to adapt to the change that is underway already and will continue into the future. And wa water is vital to both of these urgent imperatives. Climate change will most immediately and acutely be realized through water. Uh, indeed, changes in the terrestrial biosphere particularly and in human systems will be driven through water. And if you will, we believe that water offers an opportunity to unlock how to solve for the complex complexity of adapting to the change necessary in both the earth system and in human systems to navigate a pathway forward to uh, an adaptive, sustainable, and resilient future. This has been recognized by the uh, Global Commission on Adaptation, which was launched in October 2018, that is led by Ban Ki-moon, Bill Gates, and Kristalina Georgieva who saw that all of the agreements are in place. We have the Paris Agreement, we have the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, we have all of the subsidiary agreements related to advancing action collectively as a global community. But things are moving much too slowly and not at the scale necessary to solve the problem. So last year they launched the Global Commission on Adaptation to accelerate action uh, and to mobilize resources commensurate with the scale of our challenge. They've envisioned action starting in 2020 and, 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 and delivering long term to 2030. Um, anchored upon those global agreements, but mobilizing private sector actors, public actors, civil society to take urgent and accelerated action. In July of this year, water was elevated as a core action track for the Global Commission on Adaptation, and we will, we will launch the action tracks at the UN Climate Summit at the end of September. I have the honor of serving as the lead on water for the Global Center of Adaptation, and with partners, we've defined two priority areas initially for our focus. And that the, the, these priority areas relate to that imperative of managing the Earth system to sustain the conditions necessary for humans to thrive. So in that instance, we focused on resilient basins, building adaptation and resilience into the management of basins from source to sea, addressing the fundamental need to maintain ecological resilience, and to address the competing demands from agriculture, energy, industry, cities, while maintaining a robust and resilient environment. And the second scale that we've identified relates to adapting human systems, and here we focused on cities as the critical unit of intervention to address the need for human change. As you all know, cities are rapidly growing. They're the locus of economies, they're the locus of uh, society and populations. They're also acutely vulnerable already 
and will be increasingly vulnerable to climate change and the variety of impacts that are driven by climate change, many of which, if not most of which, uh, relate to water. And by 2030, we've targeted uh, integration of resilience into urban water systems in at least 500 cities, effectively managed for urban water resilience. We believe that this is necessary, achievable, uh, and commensurate with the goals that we need to set really to address this adaptation challenge. And today we're focusing in on what I would say are some of the most advanced work, uh, is, is some of the most advanced work related to urban water re resilience diagnosis and design. This is the city water resilience approach, uh, which a few years ago was piloted by Arup with uh, a series of partners that are featured here. CWE, the World Bank, 100 Resilient Cities, and the Resilient Shift. Uh, today we're focusing on advances in the approach to date, uh, applications of the approach in a variety of cities, uh, and their direct relevance to the development priorities that we face as a global community. Moving from the introduction, uh, here's the agenda that we'll have today. I'll invite uh, Louise Ellis, who's associate uh, in the water team for Arup and the Resilient Shift, who's led a lot of the analytical work uh, with a team of colleagues from Arup and the Resilient Shift in the design and deployment of the City Water Resilience Approach Toolkit. And Louise will describe uh, the work to date. Please come on up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, it's fantastic to be here at World Water Week this year, uh, presenting on our um, advances in the city water resilience approach over the last year. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce some approaches and tools um, for building water resilience in cities and utilities. The development of resilience approaches and tools began in around um, 2012, um, following Hurricane Sandy in New York, with the development of the city resilience framework and index. These have been further built on in the recent years to develop the uh, water utility frameworks and more recently the city water resilience approach. I'm just going to briefly talk about um, two of the resilient um, utility frameworks that we've built upon. Uh, the first is the Welsh water resilience framework which was, built up, uh, which was developed by Arup in partnership with Welsh Water, a private utility serving 3.2 million people in the UK. The approach uses a framework of indicators with a maturity matrix um, to diagnose the resilience of the water utility. And then from that diagnosis, they have developed 18 strategic responses across the water cycle, which form the backbone of their 30 year strategy, Welsh Water 2050. A slightly different approach has been taken by Yorkshire Water, which is a private utility in the UK. Uh, they have developed a systems based approach to resilience. Uh, for each of their internal systems, uh, they have identified the shocks and stresses that might impact on those external system, internal systems, sorry, and then the impact that their internal systems have um, in cascading onto other external systems. Once they understand this, for each system they then undertake a qualitative assessment of the resilience using the BS65000 standard on organisational resilience. Whilst these approaches are very robust for the resilience of a water utility and the resilience of one organisation, um, water resilience is about the resilience of the whole water system, including the natural catchment and man-made um, water, wastewater and stormwater systems. And there are a large number of actors involved in the resilience of the water system. These are just some of the actors um, that are involved um, in the water system of one of our partner cities, um, Greater Miami and the Beaches, and we're going to hear from Hardeep from Greater Miami and the Beaches later about how um, they have adopted the city water resilience approach. The city water resilience approach brings together water stakeholders to give their different perspectives and diagnose the resilience of the water system. And from this shared understanding of the resilience of the water system, develop a collective action plan to move forward and to build resilience. It has five core principles. Inclusive and transparent. It needs to bring together those different perspectives and also be transparent to those from the community, 
um, and citizens in the city. Its systems based takes account of the interdependencies with other urban and social and infrastructure systems. Holistic, it's not just focused on operational resilience, but also on things like leadership and strategy, planning and finance, infrastructure and ecosystems, and personal, household, and community resilience. Action orientated, encouraging the ownership, development, and progression of actions. And finally, scalable and global, from towns through to megacities, and applicable to the global context. And with this in mind, we've developed it in partnership with eight cities from around the world. As I mentioned, it's a collaborative approach and it's supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Resilient Shift with strong project partners and an expert steering group. To better understand those challenges that are facing cities and, and ensuring the approach, ensure the approach is practical and globally applicable, we've worked with eight cities across the world to develop the approach. The cities were chosen to reflect a range of geographies, a range of shocks and stresses, and governance models to inform its development. We've developed the approach um, through extensive fieldwork with around 700 stakeholders, um, through interviews, focus groups, and workshops, alongside a, lit a substantial and extensive literature review. In these interactions, we asked stakeholders to give us the factors that helped and hindered their resilience. The team compiled this information and we collected almost 1,600 factors of resilience from fieldwork and literature. These were then aggregated into families, called sub-goals, and then into 12 goals to form the City Water Resilience Framework. It has as part of it 62 um, qualitative and 40 quantitative indicators which can be used to diagnose the resilience of the water system. And this is an overview of the approach. It's a five-step process with supporting tools and frameworks to help cities um, take it step by step. The tools include the City Water Resilience Assessment Framework, as well as the Our Water Online Governance Tool. And to date, we've implemented in two cities uh, Greater Miami and the beaches and the city of Cape Town to develop resilience action plans. I'm now going to take you through each of the steps of the city water resilience approach um, and talk about how it's been applied in these two cities. The first step is about understanding the system, establishing who's going to be the city champion, who's going to convene all of the partners together understand the water system, the context, both the physical and spatial location of the water system, but also the interconnectedness with other systems. And then the understanding the governance of that water system. Who are the stakeholders who need to be around the table and, and who need to be part of the city water resilience approach? On the screen, you can see um, some of the mapping that we've done for Greater Miami and the Beaches water system using the Our Water Governance tool. Um, it allows us to map all of those different interactions and who is responsible and accountable and manages the various elements of the system. From this step, we develop the city characterization report, which sets the context and helps us to understand the context um, of the city. Step two is around assessing the urban water resilience and diagnosing the areas of strength and the areas for improvement. We do that through a multi-stakeholder assessment workshop um, using the qualitative indicators that we've developed and this scoring scale from one to five with the guiding criteria for each indicator. Alongside that, we have 40 quantitative indicators um, which allow us to look more at the lagging indicators of resilience. From the assessment, um, we compile the um, water resilience profile, um, which shows a holistic view of the water resilience in the city and allows us to develop problem statements which we can address um, in the next step of action planning. And these are two of the um, water resilience profiles, one for Greater Miami and the Beaches and one for um, the city of Cape Town. The blue dots indicate where both cities face very similar challenges. And I just wanted to talk through some of the challenges that were common between the two cities. 
Firstly, both cities have challenges in relation to coordination between upstream stakeholders and with other city system providers. And it's been acknowledged that catchment level partnerships and water management district organisations have a large role to play in facilitating resilient water management. At all levels of decision making across all organisations, and data, technical knowledge and information needs to drive action. And it's often challenging to find that data and uh, to have access, access to that data and to share the data between partners. In addition, community engagement um, is at the core of building urban water resilience and it can be challenging to reach some of the, some of the vulnerable communities. Some cities find it challenging um, to make the case for resilience investment. It's often seen as a resilience investment versus business as usual investment. And therefore, things like um, the resilience dividend and multiple capitals approaches can be used to, um, to bridge over that gap and, and uh, help solve that problem. Cities need an enabling environment for some of the uh, new green infrastructure and water urban design practices um, to help incorporate them into their city. And finally, uh, a common and uh, well-established problem across um, the water system, um, the need for the protection of surface water and groundwater um, and having sufficient data regulation and enforcement around those um, crucially important water sources. From these areas of challenge, um, each city develops a series of problem statements. Um, and through a visioning workshop, the, multi the multiple stakeholders come together um, to look at the root causes of those problems, identify multiple opportunities, and then prioritize those opportunities into interventions, which have an owner supporting actors, um, a program of works, uh, identify the resilience value, uh, an estimated cost, and the measure of success for that program. Following the development, and this forms, sorry, the development of the resilience action plan for each city. And Hardeep is going to talk um, in more detail about the action plan for Greater Miami and the beaches. Following the development of the action plan, the cities have implemented um, multi-stakeholder working groups um, for the actions to take them through detailed scoping and feasibility um, and ensure that they're supported through their implementation. In step five, evaluate, learn and adapt and the cities can use the measures of success that they've developed as part of this action planning process to review the actions that they've undertaken, as well as using the city water resilience approach to undertake a regular diagnosis of the city and um, to see how they're changing and progressing over time. On the screen are some of the actions um, from the other partner city, um, from the city of Cape Town. Some of the things that they have developed are around um, developing data and information platforms um, and, and having transparent data and information with their communities, particularly um, those in informal settlements. In addition, um, developing an adaptive master's program to give their leadership um, uh, and, uh, and help build capacity um, in resilience thinking, as well as improving governance structures and policies to encourage green infrastructure. Finally, um, I'm really delighted to announce that today we're launching a call to action uh, to get uh, to uh, bring our cities together um, through peer-to-peer -peer learning and link them with water practitioners and resilience practitioners uh, to share uh, their best practice and to learn from each other. Um, there's an opportunity at the end of the session um, to sign up for the call to, uh, the call to practice over um, on the left-hand side. Um, and it, uh, there'll be more information uh, available um, as you sign up uh, to find out how you can get involved in that call to practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, we'll transition now from approach to practice. As you can see, a lot of time was spent by the team to develop this robust approach and test it in eight cities globally. A couple of those cities have worked with us to take the next step. Uh, one of them that, that's leading the work with us is, is uh, the, uh, Greater Miami and the Beaches. Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting uh, Deputy Director for the Miami-Dade County Water and Sewer Department to describe 
the work that's been done in Miami to take the next step in implementing this approach. Hardeep Anand. Thank you, Fred, and uh, hello, everyone. Show of hands real quick. Uh, how many of you have been to Miami? Wow, that's great. And for those who haven't, that's my plug to contribute to the economy of Miami. So, so, so be the next time. Uh, so my job here is, first of all, we were very fortunate to be invited to be one of the few countries uh, to participate in this use case on the city water resilience framework. And uh, when we started, the problem statement was always about, you know, what is resilience? How do we get uh, things done? How do we operationalize resilience? Who are all the stakeholders, all the data that we collect? Uh, and how do we make some common sense out of it, right? And I'm very happy to say that once we went through this whole exercise, uh, things started getting decluttered for us. Uh, it's difficult to still operationalize. That's the rest of the story. But at least the first half of the problem statement was defined. So before I get into the specifics, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and introduce you to the ecosystem of what constitutes Miami-Dade County. We are a coastal community of about 2.7 million residents, and we are just six and a half feet above sea level. That's 1.98 meters. We are nestled between the seagrass on uh, one end and the sawgrass, so we call it a seagrass to sawgrass ecosystem, a peninsula surrounded by water on all sides. And we are very unique in the sense that our Biscayne aquifer is very shallow, very porous, so we really have water coming in from the bottom, water from the sides, and of course precipitation and water from the top. So we have water, water, water all the way around. When climate change while climate change is a global issue, it's felt on a local scale in Miami-Dade in Miami County because, as Fred said it, uh, it's going to be uh, felt through water. And even though, you know, it has been, uh, resilience has been on our radar screen for a long time, uh, we've come to the realization that resilience cannot really be a separate effort from, from projects that we undertake to operationalize resilience. They somehow need to be weaved into the conversations when we start executing uh, water resilience projects. For Miami-Dade County, climate change is real. It's impacting a community directly. And although the greater Miami the Beach still has much to offer and much, much more to, to, to act, about, act on, uh, we call it we are ground zero for climate change. The coast of South Florida has seen 12 inches of sea level rise since 1870. Since 1994, we experienced four inches of sea rise. Two to six inches is expected by 2030 and 14 inches by two feet by the year 2060. So when we say that we are almost at sea level, uh, 1.98 meters, we find ourselves at the front line uh, of adaptation action. But actions being taken by local government, our officials, universities, and other organizations are, I'm happy to say, creating a very sound foundation for what we call the plan of action for the future. And I'll share a little bit more about the Resilient 305 strategy uh, that we released a few months ago. We also have the threat of, of, of salt water intrusion. Uh, we do have a very robust measurement system uh, where we are able to utilize advanced variable density numerical groundwater modeling in partnership with the USGS. So we are looking at it uh, in real time and, and, and able to plan for uh, making sure that we mitigate the risks as they, as they present itself. Rain, of course, is no longer a prerequisite for flooding in our county. Several areas ranging from business districts and the urban core to suburban neighborhoods, tourist attractions, coastal communities, and protected lands are being threatened or being impacted by what we call is sunny day flooding. As sea level rise, sunny day flooding and its serious effect become more prevalent, including property damage, damage to the environment, and increased threat to the public health. Storm surge is the next threat to property life and in 2017, we had a hurricane, Hurricane Irma. It is shown in the black and white uh, picture to the left. Responsible for 123 deaths and about $50 billion in damages across Florida. It was a category four hurricane. And not uh, too long ago, 1992, we had Hurricane Andrew, which was equally devastating, caused 44 deaths, 27.3 billion in damages. And that was a category five hurricane. So our ecosystem, as we talked about, um, 
It includes, of course, the marine sanctuaries, the water management areas. We are a very interconnected system. But the declining health of our natural systems has the potential to cause a significant impact on public health and our economy. Our natural systems are experiencing the stress of nutrients and pollutants, pollutant loadings from stormwater runoff, harmful algae blooms, and other sources. The effects are visible from our beaches to our farmlands and from the Biscayne Bay to the Everglades National Park. While sargassum is a natural occurrence, it has become a major issue over the past few years as a direct result of rising ocean temperatures and increasing amount of nutrients from fertilizers that flow into our oceans. The Resilient 305 strategy was, is a very unique collaboration. In, two, in 2007, Miami-Dade County, the City of Miami, and the Miami Beach, City of Miami Beach, they came together to advance our community's, community's resilience under the umbrella of the 100 resilient cities. On May 30th, 2019, we released the Resilient 305 strategy following a three-year period of an extensive engagement and development effort within the county. One of the actions of the Resilient 305 strategy is to employ a one water approach through the lens of the city water resilience assessment. The challenges that we face, uh, obviously, once we started engaging stakeholders and participants and we started learning more about our challenges and concerns, our viewpoint very, very quickly shifted uh, to making sure that the governance of the water should not be viewed through different lenses because we manage water through different lenses. But how do we manage, manage our water through a single lens? Uh, and that lens, of course, was one water. So the City Water Resilience Assessment helped the Greater Miami and the Beaches identify challenges, as Luis mentioned. The assessment was used to identify and develop indicators for a more resilient water supply and management system, improve interagency collaboration on, a, on water issues, and develop and implement a One Water Resilience Action Plan. We've seen the wheels and the indicators, so I won't walk you through that process, but we, we went through the process and it became very apparent on where our strengths and weaknesses were so we could start focusing on those issues as we go through our budget cycles year after year. The highlights from the CWRA workshop included the following findings, which I think were very important to us. The first one was resilience is increasingly well recognized by leadership, but long-term planning for resilience is needed. We talk about it, but somehow having those continued conversations has posed a challenge. Early warning systems and preparedness programs are generally good for shocks and stresses, but communities are often less equipped to respond to chronic stresses. And lastly, more can be done to integrate planning across dif different regional agencies that, that collaborate on the water resilience issues. So our priority action number one was, in response to the challenge of evidence-based decisions, water and environmental data for decision making. And that translated to creating an open data portal to improve data accessibility and sharing. We collect a lot of data, but somehow those data needed to be turned into insights and stories uh, that resonate with our elected officials, with our communities, with our planners, with our capital improvement folks, with the budget folks. How do you take the same set of data and you start connecting it so that it makes sense to a different set of audiences? The second priority action for us was to institutionalize resilience. And to, ad to address this challenge of institutionalizing resilience, uh, we talked about developing a One Water Knowledge Platform. Uh, there's a lot of conversations we have in our space, but somehow that knowledge doesn't infiltrate vertically and horizontally uh, within organizations or even without or outside of organizations. So how do you bring all that knowledge uh, so that it is sustainable and these conversations are, are, don't have to be repeated uh, differently to different people? And that, that translated into the One Water Knowledge Platform. And the third priority action for us was building collaboration between governmental, community, academia, and other stakeholder groups to monitor the advancement of actions addressing areas of lower scoring qualitative and quantitative indicators as well as to advance as well as to advance key joint projects to, to achieve outcomes that benefit all uh, and we thought that you know we we've got to embark on this process of continuous improvement and, and the question of measuring resilience often comes to the forefront right uh, if you're investing capital dollars year after year after year we've got to find a way to make sure how we are improving from the previous year to the to the, to the years of the future so i think that could only translate if we had a very proactive approach uh, to to monitoring and measuring our indicators but embarking on this path of continuous improvement 
So we've got some regional efforts going on. We've got the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, which has been in action for over 10 years. And the, the Climate Change Compact has what they call the Regional Climate Action Plan, which has uh, a lot of different things going on. And as Fred had mentioned, there's so many things happening at a national, at a global level. Same thing happens at a regional level. There's many different competing, I won't say competing, but there are many different plans and objectives and standards. Uh, it's important to somehow find a way to align those. So the RCAP is one of the efforts from the Climate Change Compact. And what we had going on also was what we call the Resilient Utilities Coalition that was founded as a nonprofit about three years ago. We brought academia, consultants, uh, researchers, um, uh, community, as well as our industry partners. And the knowledge platform was being discussed, and we said, you know what, we should probably find a way to merge both of these actions. So the One Water Academy that has just been founded uh, merged with the efforts of the coalition that has been on the ground for about two or three years. And now that effort is aligning with the RCAP effort of the Climate Change Compact. So it's very critical to find local alignment that ultimately ties somehow to regional uh, or even global um, if it's a sustainable development goals. Because then ultimately that starts communicating a story to our officials, to the community. Uh, otherwise you run the risk of having very fragmented conversations. So we became very conscious of these efforts because uh, we run the risk of the fatigue factor in the community. Uh, every time we organize workshops and meetings to talk about resilience, uh, there is uh, there's the, the threat of being repetitive. Um, and we were seeing that there was a lot of fatigue in, 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 in the community and professionals because it was the same sound bites being circled uh, through different workshops and, and efforts. So that alignment has really built credibility and I hope it will build more credibility in the future for those of us involved in the water resilience space. So this is just uh, some information on the Academy in case you're interested, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Hardeep. You, much appreciated. So Hardeep and colleagues, uh, cities like um, um, Greater Miami and the beaches, uh, we can call them first movers, and first movers are critical to take the initial risks uh, in, in innovative approaches to, you know, advancing our paradigms for for development uh, and addressing uh, the challenges that are faced globally, that are faced very acutely by Miami, which has water coming in at all angles. The question then becomes, how does this inform broader practice? How do we mainstream it? What regulatory practices might be then implied by or regulatory standards might be implied by this approach to designing for resilience which we understand is critical. Uh, next we'll have uh, Mr. Trevor Bishop who is a director of Water Resources Southeast in the UK who's grappling with these uh, challenges of how to mainstream and scale and what implications there are for the utilities across the, the southeast of, of the UK. Trevor please come up. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred, and a very good afternoon uh, to all of you today, and a very big thank you to Arup and the Resilient Shift for putting this event together this afternoon and the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Um, as Fred alluded, uh, a year ago I was sat in the economic regulator in England and Wales in my ivory tower writing all the wonderful things that I expected water companies to do on resilience. Twelve months later, I find myself working with those same water companies, sometimes being lambasted by my ex-colleagues about our performance on resilience. So I guess it's almost the classic uh, you reap what you sow type scenario for me. I've been asked to talk about some of the challenges that water companies are facing in England and Wales and the UK generally in terms of resilience. Water Resources Southeast, to put it in context, is an alliance of the six water companies across the southeast of England. It has six cities with London at its centre, over 20 million people being supplied, uh, about 40% of the UK's GDP is in that area. Water resources are 105% fully utilised. There is no spare capacity by the way we did things in the past, and we face very, very deep uncertainty with regard to climate change and other factors which will affect resilience. So I've been asked first of all to talk about the challenges that we face and I've got five. I think each one of these five is a really good potential PhD project. So if there's people out there looking for a subject matter, it'd be great to maybe have a chat afterwards. I'll be as candid as I can about really what we found trying to apply the resilience thinking in the UK water sector. 
And I think there's some real issues with regard to professionally, intellectually and culturally, we have to accept we're on a journey. I don't think even the regulator in its wildest dreams expected us to get to utopia overnight. There are some really fundamental sh differences uh, and developments that are needed in the way we plan, think, and operate for the future and we're going through that process now so if I just go through these five and see whether there's any resonance with some of you and whether you recognize some of these first of all it's taken a long time to embed the shift from risk management to resilience even now people get it but they revert back to type and it's very easy to do Part of this is because water companies are structured in terms of their teams, their budgets, their KPIs, managers, bonuses, etc., very much on a functional basis. They don't tend to look at their company, the way they operate, on a systems basis. And that's slowly changing, but it's a really complex shift in their mindset and the way they operate. And culturally, it's a very big shift. So there's an embedded barrier to resilience thinking within the structure and the governance model, both within companies, but also within uh, regulators, etc. So the machine itself is not yet aligned with the resilience thinking. So it's almost fighting itself within that circle. The second one is science and planning. And there's a growing number of us that are asking some really quite fundamental questions about the fact that we're doing some super sophisticated stuff with planning. Some enormous great big models and they need quantum computing to come on quicker so we can run even more, you know, thousands of scenarios, etc. But there's a real concern. Are we over planning and underthinking? And the reason I say that is because we're starting to see a drift in the quality and correlation, particularly of our models of the natural environment, with what the models are suggesting and what we're observing in reality. And almost all our models of the natural environment are stochastic in nature. They're a correlation of observations with a mathematical equation. Very few of them are genuinely deterministic. And that's pretty well fine under a stable climate. But as the climate shifts, the confidence in those models deteriorates and very few people are thinking about science at first principles and revisiting the very basis for how we think about the natural environment and how it might respond in the future. And we're already seeing that drift and that is really causing some quite significant problems and a tremendous area for research and innovation I think in this sector. Regulation. Regulators have done a great job of embracing the concept of resilience, systems thinking, thinking about interdependencies, interrelationships, trying to regulate in that way. But as with water companies, the way they are structured in terms of their teams, in terms of their budgets, in terms of their KPIs, is very much functionally based. And also, although the regulator and the legislation has tried to move away from just-in-time, least-cost, high-value economics, it's very difficult to actually show the value of resilience and increasingly to many regulators it can look like an insurance policy and with a privatized model it can look worse than an insurance policy so it's a very tough sell a very tough choice and that brings me to my fourth point and I'm not going to advocate for a private model or a public model they've both got tremendous benefits in their own way in their own jurisdictions etc but my observation is that with the privatized model one of the disadvantages is the fact that there's a real issue of culture and trust between the regulators and the companies. Effectively, what you end up with some really, really clever people playing uh, intellectual shadow boxing about whether they can outperform the regulatory contract. And maybe in a relatively inefficient, immature regime, that's probably got, you know, some mileage. But as the regime becomes ever more efficient, ever more refined, and in this case deals with deep uncertainties, that model starts to social cracks and the model of economic regulation can start to look like a bit of a blunt instrument. And the consequences of the regulator having to make choices on risks, which of course they are never going to be as close to as the companies themselves, is a very difficult real one. So culture, trust and a common agenda is something we need to do much more about. The fifth one I want to touch on um, is what does good resilience look like? There's still a fundamental mind block in many people, in companies, in regulators, in stakeholders, etc. And we keep hearing the same old message, uh, resilience for water supply equals extra capacity and headroom. Full stop, end of story, let's build a reservoir and we all go home. 
I think here we all understand that actually resilience is far more complex and what good resilience looks like is far more complex than that. And I don't think yet even looking at the international agenda we're where we need to be on that. So for instance if you happen to be in the southeast and you're, uh, you've got five reservoirs to supply your city and you think for a bit more resilience I'll build a sixth one so I've got some headroom, that's great as long as you don't get longer than a two year drought but if you do you've then put yourself in a failure mode whereas some diversity in terms of the way you manage demand conjunctive use the way you look at different types of resource solutions working in combination that what makes resilience resilience as opposed to risk management and that's a really tough sell and particularly on the economics as well so the second thing I was asked to do uh, was sort of revisit uh, where we are in terms of resilience policy uh, in England and Wales. So when I was uh, in uh, off what that 12 months ago, we had recently published a document called Resilience in the Round. Um, it was meant to be a thought piece to help the companies and the sector have a proper mature discussion about how they would approach resilience in the next planning round. So the next period of review is what we call it. So that's where effectively they bid for the money they need to do the job that they've agreed to do with their customers. And at the time when we published it, we were all puffed up. We sort of talked to lots of people around the world and we tried to sort of bring the best of the best together. And to some extent, we probably had. But as with all these things, it's barely a couple of days or a couple of weeks after you produce something like that, you start to think, actually, if I was writing it again, well, I'd do it quite differently. Uh, and I think a year on, uh, off what and both ourselves within the wider sector have learned so much more by attending events like this, listening to other people and trying to be as open-minded as possible about not locking ourselves into one way of do things. Two things I think Resilience in the Round did do in England and Wales. First of all was systems thinking. If you'd said systems thinking to a chief executive of a water company three years ago, they would have assumed you were a wide-eyed academic. Now they don't. It's the language they use in their presentations time and time again. And systems thinking is starting to affect the way they think about managing their companies, they plan for the future and the way they engage with their stakeholder regulators and government. And that's a big step forward. The other big one for me, and this is very strange that Ofwat did this, and I'm really proud that it did, it recognised the, the environment is one of the key systems. But it's more than just another system. It's a really important system that underpins water and waste water services. And that recognition by the regulator that the environment is not just a set of uh, legislative um, uh, obligations that have to be delivered, actually look at the environment at the system that underpins everything you do is absolutely key. And following that through, I think, will be key to the sustainability and resilience. Was that one minute or five minutes? One minute. I've got 30 seconds then. I'm going to, in 30 seconds, I'm going to do something that I wouldn't normally do. So very, very quickly, I've been having conversations with some of you in this conference about how are we doing as a sector? Do we think we're winning on climate change and resilience? And I think many of you, particularly those with children, are worried about where we're going and whether we as a sector are doing enough. And maybe it's time to start thinking about doing some things differently on resilience. And I had a fascinating uh, meeting uh, last Friday. I got invited to a, a very hippie conference in the darkest, deepest depths of Sussex to meet the leadership uh, of the Extinction Rebellion, who many of you may have heard about. That groundswell of public opinion and movement uh, who believe that some things need to change. Now, I don't have time to go into it more detail, unfortunately, but I think there's a real opportunity because they are triggering governments to want to do things, but the governments don't know what they need to do and how they need to do it. I think there's a really important role for us in this sector to up our game, to change our approach in terms of our influencing, and not see people that talk about extinctions and rebellions and glue themselves to lampposts as some wide-eyed loonies. Actually, they're the people we all serve, and actually, maybe they could be a real catalyst for some of the change that we've not been able to deliver so far. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Trevor. That was excellent. Uh, it's a good thing we don't have time to hear about what else you did at the uh, at the dark hippie uh, hippie convening, but uh, you know where to find him. <laughs> uh, excellent perspective. Say, thank you. So, you know, that commitment to experimentation, to learning, to to adaptive management is really fundamental to any 
uh, prospect of mainstreaming uh, in, into regulatory standards, into, the, into management by established utilities, uh, given uncertainty and, and, and given both uncertainty related to present decisions and uh, uncertainty related to the, to the tools that we have uh, available to equip diagnosis and design of, of resilient water systems. And here we've talked about two developed country contexts where, where the complexity is already evident. Next we're going to transition to, uh, to discussing how this applies to the developing world and how this can be mainstreamed in the, into the practice of international financial institutions that are aiding developing countries to confront challenges of sustainable development and resilience. And I'll in invite my friend uh, Maria Angelica Sotomayor, uh, practice manager for the World Bank, to, to talk about uh, their experiences. Please. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really um, important for the bank to be part of this team because we have the opportunity to learn uh, what the uh, developed world is doing and how we can share those experiences with our clients. Um, I would like to just to, to ensure we're talking about the same thing as, I, as we try to switch to, to the developing world. Most of our cities are uh, in a stress reality. So there's not even 24 seven service and uh, these cities are already struggling to, to provide uh, water supply and sanitation. In many places, uh, there's not um, enough water for all the competing sources, uh, uses. So uh, with that in mind, uh, they are also exposed to climate change. As we know, cities are at the center of uh, economic development and growth and they are uh, particularly crucial for uh, ensuring the development of, of the countries is where most of the GDP is, is created. As population growth uh, rates increase and cities grow in a disorganized, unplanned way, uh, mostly in slums, um, the uh, impact that, that these cities see on, of climate change and what we're calling the water crisis of too much, too little, and too polluted, are really at the core of the struggle that cities in the developing uh, world are facing. So uh, we need to bring a different way of thinking, uh, bring in an integrated approach, and uh, bring in coordination among the different levels of government um, so that there could be some uh, prosperous future in, in these areas. Uh, there's a need to identify trade-offs and opportunities in the different sectors, um, understanding that uh, we need to uh, learn from, from others like the UK and introduce the systems um, view, the, the, the system on uh, having a long-term planning horizon. And all of this is very uh, difficult given the reality that our cities face. Uh, since 2012 or so, the bank has been developing and focusing on uh, the resilience of cities. And uh, within it, that they touch about uh, different aspects, including water. However, uh, what we've noticed is that in many of those uh, cities, uh, we need an in-depth look at, at the water. And uh, we need to um, focus on and have a, a specific assessment that we can use to help our clients um, embark in those long-term solutions uh, with a better, um, let's say, possibility of success, given all the constraints that they are facing. So this wasn't enough, and we've been um, really um, grateful that we are part of this interesting group uh, of uh, AROP and the Resilient Shift and 100RC, Rockefeller and others, because uh, as they uh, join us into these conversations, I think the value that we've brought is a bit of a reality check of, okay, uh, this works in the UK, how we 
will do this in Africa or in India. So uh, I think we have uh, together developed uh, an approach that we're confident can help improve the way we, we do business and the way we are uh, helping um, develop our large investment uh, projects in, in um, cooperation with, with our client countries. Uh, we recognize it needs to be both a bottom-up exercise with the key stakeholders, uh, but also to bring uh, to the discussion others that are not necessarily at the city level. We need the, to bring the uh, river basin approach. We need to bring the Ministry of Planning, the Ministry of Finance, and uh, show the value and the case uh, of, of resilience that is competing with many other um, priorities, development priorities that cities uh, face. It's important to have um, an alignment, a, a tool that uh, allows to bring all those stakeholders together uh, to argue uh, for uh, investments that take into account this approach that are based in a more um, scientific evidence that we can borrow or, or learn from our develop, uh, the developed world uh, and uh, come to a um, place where we can have identification of uh, strategic investments, but then a prioritization of those, uh, also mobilizing different sources of finance uh, so that we can pool resources in a more efficient way uh, to work with our clients to develop uh, probably a, hopefully, a better um, resilient future. So this is really the, the, the value that we see and we are really excited to continue working and piloting this uh, with, our con with our client countries. Thanks so much, Maria Angelica. And, and as you may or may not know, the, the, the bank generally doesn't have license to, to take a lot of uh, risk to innovate in their approaches. So this engagement by Maria Angelica and, and Diego Rodriguez, who uh, also participates on, this, on the steering committee, has both informed the steering committee on, on its application of this approach to the developing world and how it might be mainstreamed into the World Bank approach, and has given them license also to work with a, a, a collective of colleagues to innovate, to experiment, and to pilot uh, in, the, in the eight cities globally uh, with us. Um, part of that piloting opportunity uh, relied greatly on the partnership of the 100 Resilient Cities program uh, and Katrin Brubach, who's the water lead for 100 Resilient Cities, who both helped us to get the word out to the 100 Cities Network to, uh, so that they could submit applications to pilot the work and then worked it hand in hand with the field teams to implement the approach in these cities across the globe. And with that also we had, uh, in, in addition to, the, to uh, Inigo, uh, to Alexa, to uh, Louise uh, and George, who worked from the Arab team on the ground with the cities in piloting the work. We also brought in Siwi in close partnership to bring a strong uh, uh, resilience element uh, to the approach. And, and in that, uh, uh, Panchali uh, 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 Sakia, I'm sorry, I, I butchered your name once again. My good friend Panchali, whose last name I can't pronounce, uh, <laughs> was instrumental uh, uh, in, in bringing in that, that, that governance approach. Uh, I'd like to invite Katrin uh, Panchali and the speakers to, to, to join us uh, for a panel discussion now, which will be led by uh, Dr. Mark Fletcher, who's the water leader for uh, Arab. Please come on up. Uh, th thanks very much for that, Fred. We're just going to assemble ourselves. We're going to have a mic that's going to go across the uh, across the panel so that they can uh, respond, and I'm not going to expect them all to respond to every question. So I've, 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 it'll be sort of two or three responses per question, um, and they may come out about across a little at random just to surprise you. Um, the idea of this session is just for us to maybe uh, dig a little deeper. We've had quite a lot coming at us. Um, I think it'd be quite important now that we get maybe a bit more perspective. So I thought, um, can you hear that? 
it's very confusing having both on at the same time, so I'll leave that off for now. Um, I'm going to start maybe uh, with Trevor at that end, so if we could pass. Um, we're going to try and keep our responses quite concise and so that everybody's on the same page, but Trevor, what do you think the, are the key challenges in moving water resilience or resiliency, is the same thing, from dialogue, when we're talking about it, to delivery when we're doing something, when we're looking at implementation. Mm -hmm. that, that stage that we're looking to move from talking about it and planning it to making things happen. So, so for me, thanks Mark for that uh, question. I mean, there's a number of things I could, I, I could lay bare, I guess, but for me, the overriding one is I believe politicians, and I've seen politicians do great things, absolutely great things. And every time I've seen them think intergenerationally, I think beyond their sort of uh, their own sort of political uh, horizon, has been when the community and society has been with one voice, and it makes decision making for them, particularly tough decisions, so much easier. And if we can get collaboration and cohesion on what actions need to be taken by who, by when, and we can deal with the naysayers, then we're in a far stronger position to actually see the intervention we need. So as I was saying at the end of my talk earlier, we've done great stuff in this sector, our science, our thinking, our policy, et cetera, et cetera. But on our own, we're not enough. You know, it's the influence side of what we do, which is probably the next big leap of faith. And of course, there's good stuff done there, but we're not all professionals at influencing. I think we need to understand what triggers action in government in a way that maybe we haven't done before. Which is, I think that's a really strong message at a global conference like this where we're talking about inclusiveness and us getting a, lot, a sense of, I think, common purpose around what we're doing. So I think that's a really good start for us. I wonder whether, uh, maybe Katrin, maybe you could give us a, a perspective. What do you think, are the, maybe another key challenge what's the thing that comes to mind for you that we can you know as a takeaway i think um for me the key challenge is that and and coming from a background working with potentially a hundred cities globally is that cities around the world even if they are in the developed and in devel developing countries face a lot of problems in the sense that they don't know how to get their problems together and to solve them so so by actually looking at flooding in, in, in one month and six, six months later um, um, battling with water scarcity like Chennai, they are, they are forced into a kind of system thinking to tackle all the problems and thinking about how creating resilience. And I strongly believe that um, to, to understand these challenges and to find solutions which tackle challenges at the same time but not only focusing on one and helping them and bringing them together and helping them to, to coordinate and to talk to each other. And, and we have seen amazing things uh, of developed countries talking with developing countries and developing solutions together. I think um, resilience not only in the water system but also in cities in general offers an, an amazing opportunity and it, it will unite us and it will create not only social cohesion potentially in the city which we have done I think fairly successfully in Cape Town through the water resilience work but also globally and I, I think that's that's super amazing. I'm, I'm really encouraged that we're talking about cities it doesn't really matter whether it's a C40 cities or 100 resilient cities, or maybe Fred's global 500 cities. You know, I think the important thing is that we, we are uh, finding a way to practically go across the water cycle at catchment scale with cities in a pragmatic way. Really encouraged. I wondered, Hardy, maybe we've, we've sort of, we've looked at the, um, we've looked at the resilience assessment itself from a greater Miami, Miami perspective, you must now be seeing that there's, there's probably there's, in, there's delivery already occurring in some, some cases. I think we've heard about there's some green infrastructure already taking place. What do you think some of the key challenges as we go from this dialogue to implementation? So, I'll, uh, Mark, I, I think I'll piggyback on what Trevor said and even Katrine said. Uh, and I'll add another dimension to it, and I think that dimension would be the community. Uh, two things come to mind. One, I think, is we take water for granted, 
at least in the developed countries. And, and we know that. We flush our toilets. We expect stuff to magically disappear, water to, dis uh, to evaporate when it rains. You turn on the faucet, you want water. But those conversations just remain there. Uh, we don't do more beyond it. And I think if you're able to bridge the gap between our governments, elected officials, and the community, uh, I think then the community will start wanting to do more, right? And the thought there is we've learned how to fix our transportation systems. We've learned to fix our airport systems, our satellites and space systems. So what's really the challenge in the water system? And I think the funding issue comes to mind. And the reason the funding issue comes to mind is because our political horizons are probably two to four years. Our water horizons are from 25 years to 100 years. So how do you have a sustainable conversation over time, every time there's a change in political cycles? That only happens if you have an integrated approach to some sort of planning, but that integrated approach has to be embedded with some sound data, because if you get questioned by the new governance, then you've got to be able to defend it with credibility. So the insurance, the marketing, the banking industry, the health industry, everyone are using data left, right, and center. We get a lot of data within our sector. But then there's a whole conversation, an ecosystem of data governance, data integrity, because then you become victims of garbage and garbage out, right? So there's a whole lot of work, I think, done. Uh, there's, there's opportunities, so to speak. There's challenges, but the opportunities then would be on data, telling a story, but trying to tell the story to our community and celebrating our successes a little bit more. We don't celebrate our successes enough. I like that. I, I, I would absolutely, absolutely agree with you. And you've sort of triggered something. That is the, when we think about short-term politics, and yet uh, our civilizations built cathedrals. When, when our politicians or the people who we put our faith in and trust in looked beyond their own self-interest. Now, at a time when we're facing a greater threat than we've ever faced or the future of humanity, now's the time, I think, to, to come together and look beyond, b beyond the little five, four-year, three-year horizon. Maybe we'll start to see that in New York. I'd hope that we do. We'll move, we'll move on to a, a, a slightly different tack. The, what are the greatest opportunities to build water resilience? That's a how open a question is that? Fantastic question. If I was sat there about to respond to that, I would think that is my dream question. And I can see that, Panchali, I can see you're, you're, you're about to burst. So there you go. What are the greatest opportunities? I think we have already started doing that, and that is more looking at the local level the cities that we are trying to really focus on. For example, countries cannot really build resilience um, in a situation where they're facing drought in some place and maybe in another city or state they're facing flood at the same time. And sometimes a city is fla facing a drought and immediately in a seasonal variation they're facing floods. So how can re you, we build resilience at that stage? And I think all these initiatives around cities and building water resilience in cities at local level is a very good initiative that I feel is we are on that way, we are on that pathway. Uh, one thing from the previous question and I wanted to really relate to as a challenge and also opportunity uh, is with the sectoral priorities, um, uh, with the water and interdependent systems that we are talking about. Different sectors have different priorities and their budget really revolves around those priorities. How can we really integrate and find opportunities to really connect uh, water as an entry point, water resilience as an entry point to those sectors, and then bring water resilience as a priority agenda in their budget, in their planning processes? That, that I think that's re that it's really powerful stuff. It, it's the thinking about the how and the who. And uh, I can remember a term, glocal. How do we get global but delivered local? And it's all about that space. And I've got to say, I think a lot of the insight that came from the governance in the, in the way in which we've approached everything, I think has really changed all of, all of our, the way in which we've thought. I think Maria, we, M Maria and Helica, we've got, what are the greatest opportunities to build water resilience? World Bank. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, a huge opportunity. I mean, it's uh, very important to bring these 
a tool, everything that we do, I mean, everything that we do should be resilient. Otherwise, there's no uh, long-term horizon. So I think uh, that's having that narrative and bringing this to the center of the policy dialogue uh, is key. Uh, we, we interact through the, through the Ministry of Finance in, in the countries where we, where we, where we are. Uh, and one thing that we, we, we can do together is to bring these uh, local realities to the discussion uh, of the central government or federal government uh, so that uh, budgets are, are there and, and the impact uh, that water has, um, not just for the city as an urban center, but as the uh, engine of growth where most of the GDP of all the countries are uh, generated in urban areas, uh, or agriculture, which is very much linked to whatever happens in the city, as we, for example, learn together in the Cape Town case. So I think there's a, uh, having this narrative and bringing this to the discussion is a huge opportunity uh, to make a difference. Uh, thinking also in terms of uh, contingent financing, uh, helping also uh, the planning of the financial um, sector in a different way so that uh, in, the, in the financial planning they also take into account uh, those variabilities that we see when we invest in long-term uh, projects of infrastructure or so, uh, and, and I've, I think, and that's another really important thing that uh, you've prompted in the approach where we've, we've looked at this trend where more people are now living in cities than are living in rural areas. So, of course, cities are really important. The fact that a lot of the time, cities influences to city boundaries, not to that catchment scale. So, these these country realities, these city realities, the local realities are really important. And I think often we go with global international perceptions and we don't take the time to engage at the right level to really understand the context. And if we don't understand the context, we're never going to get something that really works. Um, I thought, um, uh, Catherine, having cast around a uh, hundred resilient cities, you must have p seen loads of opportunities. What do you think the greatest opportunity to build water resilience? I think the greatest opportunity is that more than 80% actually want to do that and realize that there is a need to do that. So we are in this amazing situation around the world that we don't even have to sell water resilience anymore because they know they need it and they know they want it. And, and I think that's the greatest opportunity we have. And, and just playing around with the figures and playing around with FRED's 500 cities is that I would assume from looking at our cities or the 100 resilient cities and the C40 cities, because we largely overlap as well, is that most probably out of the 500, uh, the Global Commission uh, wants to tackle, I would say most probably 450 are ready to go because they know that they need to move. So, and I, I think that's, in my opinion, the greatest opportunity, but also the biggest challenge because I, I literally have no idea how we get this done. Um, and, and that's why I think it's so important that we are sitting here today and that we start thinking about now the demand is there, now we need to look forward on how we're going to deliver and where we get the money from and, um, and, and then, then move. That's, I think that's a great opportunity. But just to, let's just open out the, the Fred's going to throw the mic and try and take somebody out. It, yeah, it's, a lot, it's a lot better with the cover. We tried it this morning without the cover. And I'll tell you, we've got three people in A&E &E at the too moment easy. receiving. That's too close. So, um, that must have prompted some of you out here to fire your hands in the air and say, yeah, we're absolutely with you, this is what we're going to do. But one thing I hope we can all do, can we all not kick the ball into the long grass? We've seen enough, of, enough balls kicked in the long grass with promises in the future. 
it's time to act. Oh, so, Stu, would you like to come back with maybe with a comment for yeah, us? Yeah, would you mind? So, excellent, really excellent uh, discussion. And I'll be putting our institution's name up there. I'm Stuart Orr, head of Freshwater at WWF. Obviously, this links to the wider basin agenda. It links to uh, protection of biodiversity, NBS. So, you know, we're in. Um, but let me play devil's advocate for a second, because long before Cape Town was a water crisis, it was an institutional and governance crisis. Ten years of inaction, ten years of not investing in broken pipes and working on institutions and thinking about the future. So I don't believe in a second that suddenly cities are resilient. Right? And I, I, I didn't see enough up here about what is the institutional resilience that is going to be required? How is that going to be monitored, invested in? Because to me, if you don't get the institutions and governance consistent and with you on this journey, you are stuffed, uh, to use a technical term. <laughs> I, th I think it, I think it's, sorry. <laughs> this is like tapping your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. It's not very easy to do, and I think I'm doing I think I'm doing both. Um, I think it's a really important point, and I think in a short um, in a short presentation, we've not been able to fully um, express all the work done on the governance side and the institutional side. That I think you're absolutely right. If we said one thing that really was a, a wake-up moment was when we started down that direction and suddenly realised how much that dramatically informed the, the direction in which we're going. I'd, I'd, I'd say that. Perhaps ask uh, Hardeep to, to reflect on that question. Hardeep, would you like to maybe? Sure. Um, it's a great question. It's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. I think we all recognize it. Uh, but I think the if you really peel the onion back on it, it boils down to several variables, right? And that variable ultimately boils down to something that I look at credibility because, yes, you're right, there's probably sometimes uh, lack of transparency on, on all dimensions, right? From not, not intentional because we get so busy doing our work from our operator standpoint um, that we don't take enough time in communicating our challenges uh, and those challenges only get communicated probably at budget time. So that's, that's too late. And when that's too late, the governance, whether it's elected officials, whether it's regulators or whoever is responsible for making decisions, I think at that time it's again too late because they shouldn't be listening to issues and challenges only at budgeting time or they shouldn't be listening to these issues when disaster strikes. If resilience is a journey and if it's a shock and stressor approach, whether it's emerging contaminants, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's aging infrastructure, saltwater intrusion, all of the shocks and stresses exist. So I think then the onus ultimately, if you start really doing this root cause analysis, it boils down to the professionals again. And, and I want to take that accountability on ourselves because that again is not very easy because you need a new ecosystem of professionals today. Gone are the days where civil engineers are just water professionals, right? Today we are talking of data science. So education is still in the civil engineering field needs to bring data professionals into it. Governance is being talked, it's a law issue, it's a policy issue. And, and I think when we start looking at that lens and we start making an effort in looking at innovation, which becomes a buzzword, but what is innovation? So the concepts of, for example, in the operator's sense or in the utility sense, the concept of digital twins. Can you replicate a digital twin of a water treatment plant, bring innovation, bring data, bring conversations, and have a continued sustained conversations with all stakeholders, not just governance, not just elected officials? I think then that momentum will resonate over time. And I think that is the key because, and, and I'm saying this from my personal own, f own experience. So there's a lot of layers of things to be done and you're absolutely right. I, I, you know, I call water professionals as water utilities as the first responders to first responders with all due respect to first responders. But yet, and we know, the, the, I think the National Infrastructure Advisory Council has shown very clearly in a graphic from 30 minutes to eight hours when anything strikes a water utility everything starts coming down, schools, hospitals, firefighting, transportations, airport, but yet we get the least amount of uh, limelight, so to speak. So uh, I think that is where uh, our focus and emphasis should be. Uh, we've got to reflect a little bit more as water professionals and, and take it into operationalizing these conversations.
Thanks, Hardy, for that. Another yeah. question, I can't, oh, sorry, I couldn't see. Could you just, to help us, could you just say sort of who you are and then your question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I am Abdullah Borak from uh, Morocco. I work in a uh, river basin agency. So uh, my question is about uh, what uh, uh, the limit between or the border, the border between, uh, between resilience and governance of some phenomena like uh, flood, uh, because we can uh, we can um, uh, speak or talk about uh, about resilience, but uh, we have problem in managing flood and uh, uh, flood in, in in the city. Uh, so uh, now uh, sometime uh, we have some people who didn't know wants to construct in in flood area so when we 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 we, uh, we didn't uh, we, we don't accept the 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 they told us that they want to to to, to construct and they assume the, the, their resp responsibility uh, but they don't know the risk exactly uh, so what it means the, the limit and uh, the work uh, that we must to to, to do on, on in local to to explain to them uh, the, 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 the phenomena and the, the, uh, the severe problem. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I, I mean, I know in some countries their, their whole planning policy limits development in floodplains and where uh, floods exist. However, as we're in a dynamic condition and, we're, and certain places are experiencing floods that have never occurred before, I think it's a, a really uh, important issue. I wonder whether maybe... Um, uh, maybe Pan Panchali or Trevor might uh, um, uh, give us a, a, re a quick, concise response on this one. Yes, um, I mean, oh, we are sorry we couldn't really present everything from the city water resilience approach, but actually governance is a very important and it's embedded in the city water resilience framework to really understand how the processes around planning, the process ar around uh, strategies development is actually looking into some of those processes, whether it's kind of having those governance qualities, like whether it's participatory or not, whether there is accountability mechanisms or not. So it's it's a very strong and very uh, important component of the city water resilience approach and we can share more information around that. Um, on your question, if I got it correctly, I think it's a very uh, intertwined, like I said, uh, governance really helps in building and enhancing resilience uh, and that is what our objective is. Um, with the planning that is made, how it is uh, the planning is it with different stakeholders, how participatory are those planning made, our communities are really engaged understanding their needs, how can the community's capacity be developed so that even in situations of disasters they can adapt, self-organize themselves. So I think this is a very important component and we are really looking into building resilience through strengthening water governance. Thanks Panchali. So uh, a quick one from Trevor, quick response from Catherine because I'm quite keen to get some questions in from the from the audience because the, the hands that you probably can't see, they're firing up all over the place. Thank, thank you. And your question, I think, also links quite closely to Stuart's previous point with regard to institutional and governance arrangements not always being aligned with good resilience. And that's absolutely right. And it's going to take a long time, particularly for well-established countries, to change the institutional and governance arrangements. But actually, things can be done despite institutional and governance arrangements which are in place. So what we're doing is a multi-sector resilience plan, not a multi-sector water plan so it will assess flood it will assess cyber it will uh, assess water resources drought it will assess third party damage etc etc and there's various approaches like that taking place internationally now they're at quite an embryonic stage but i think we i think people and institutions and utilities can do things despite some of the institutional barriers which are there and particularly if there's a sense of common purpose to work around some of those barriers uh, thanks helpfully. that's really helpful and the more open source and shared the these things are the more we share knowledge that's why we have conferences like this so we can share it so we can learn from each other great that m we listen more uh, Katrin you, you I and, think you wanted to add a and and actually Trevor you, you took you took the words out of my mouth and I think uh, coming back to the Cape Town example and taking uh, coming back to what you said although we are sitting here at the water conference the entry point in, in seven out of the eight cities we engaged with in the past was through the resilience office 
which uh, was established under the Handled Resilient Cities program. I'm saying that not because I'm super proud of, of that this happened, but this office is not a water resilience office. It's an office with, which is institu institutionalized within the city government to drive re resilience across all urban systems. And I think that was a major shift in Cape Town because in Cape Town, the water resilience push came through the resilience office and the utility came in and the regional government came in and so on. Um, um, the, the picture was, which was shown by Hardeep in the presentation before is there are three chief resilience officers in Miami which are actually guiding this strategy. And I think this is super important and you said it. It's not only about water resilience, it's about city and beyond city resilience. And I think that is an important aspect. It, it is, and that system of systems thinking and this interdependency of systems is really, that's advanced thing and I think that's really got to be embraced. Now, I think we've got, uh, we're going to take a question over here, then here, and then here. We'll take the three questions, so we'll see what they are, and the one at the back. Okay, we'll take the four questions, and then we'll use what time we've got to try and answer as best we can. We'll start with this gentleman here, this handsome gentleman here. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm Alejandro Jimenez, director of uh, WASH here at Siwi, and uh, glad to have been part of this uh, project and really looking forward to the continuation. My question to all of you is uh, if we look at how we can implement this in many more cities, I wanted to have your views on a couple of key points that uh, at least we find. First is how to keep political engagement in the long term. Uh, beyond elections and so on so trying to get your views on that how to how to make it happen secondly the integration across different levels of government which typically also is uh, weak and how to make that stable in uh, to look for resilience and sec and third like how can we get the champions with sufficient so support and uh, yeah, and drive to make implementation happen. Uh, thank you very much. That was a, that was a very concise three questions. <laughs> but, but I think the gentleman next to you, yeah. and then uh, we'll, we'll take all the questions and see if we've got common issues. Just a short observation. I agree absolutely with Alejandro was saying. Uh, in terms of governance, it's not only having the institutions, it's having strong institutions. I'm uh, the Mexico City Water Fund director and uh, the new government wiped out the resiliency agency. It's non-existent anymore, as well as the resiliency strategy. So uh, this is why you have to work outside of the water box with other ministries to give it the sufficient force to this agenda uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, this cross-sectoral view that you were outlining is critical. And finally, in the risk assessment, it's so important to have the political and social risk mapped out because sometimes you can have the perfect uh, budget, the perfect project, the perfect conditions, but if those two elements are uh, a little bit iffy, then everything could uh, come down uh, so in a minute. They're re really important points for us to take on board. And I, think that's, I think they're more comments than questions and, and that really helps. Yes? All right. Um, my name is Tess Sprague. I'm a water resources planner based in San Francisco. Um, and my question is a little more specific to the, um, uh, the point about mismatching planning horizons when we talk about political planning versus uh, uh, climate um, resilience planning in general. And I had heard as an approach when we look at um, adaptive management for coastal resilience in California, for example, that having multiple time horizons with triggers for action is maybe one approach that can try to combat that mismatch. So what I wanted to ask uh, to any of the members of the panel is, have you seen that as a strategy implemented in any of the cases that you've, you've worked in any of the cities, um, and how successful or not was that? Thank you. Okay, and I think, and I think we just, there's a, a, a cluster of two questions at the back. Fantastic catch. Hi, my name is Laura Inha. I come from the Tampere University, Finland. Uh, researching resilient water services and I wanted to ask uh, a question related to the definition of resilience because resilience is not just resisting change right it's more about being flexible in front of the change and being able to change 
So how how do you see it's possible to be resilient and especially have resilient policies and governance and regulations which by nature often are more mm, stagnant and not so flexible? Thank you very much. I'm not sure they have to be stagnant and not flexible, but I, but I take your point. I think it's a very valid one. Yes, um, I agree. Yeah. So we'll... <laughs> well, we might have, we might just uh, hit that one on the head. Thanks very much. <laughs> Read our report. <laughs> um, no, and uh, yes. Yes, Alicia Douglas with the Water Rising Institute. I would really like to hear your thoughts as it relates to AI water and the future of using um, sensors to be able to detect things in real time. But more importantly, how do we start sharing that from a crowdsourcing to be able to make uh, decisions with that information? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. A, a, a really valuable point. I know some cities, uh, Newcastle's one where they've started instrumenting the city and the catchments open source so that people from different places around the world can access the same information and, and work on research on the basis that they will themselves openly share all the research that they do, which I think is quite useful. So, um, so we've had a few questions there. Who's, who, um, can anyone remember them first? I, I've scribbled them down. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I thought um, it was quite interesting, this, this mismatching timing. I thought that was quite useful. I think um, uh, as we got questions about the cross-party politics, um, we then got the example of Mexico and how, th you know, things beyond our control sweep straight across and it causes real challenges. Any, anyone want to pick up on any of those two? Uh, Mari, Maria Angelica? Hey, I, I think that mm, we will never be able to um, build anything totally resilient, especially to the political agenda, right? But th there's a lot of things that can be done so that you have a better chance of sustaining the, the path. And, I, and I, one is the population. This has to be a priority for the people, for the community. Um, and we need to work across all levels of, of government. Not necessarily all of them change at the same time, or not necessarily all of them are from the same uh, view. But if you have a discussion with different levels of, of, of policies, you have a better chance that some of them will remain. But as long as data uh, is available and population understand the risk that they face, I think there is a better chance that you have the support uh, of the people or sustaining this, either with the government or sometimes with the private sector or with a civil society organization. They are also uh, powerful in, in many cases. Uh, to bring this or to maintain the view and that you don't lose what you have what you have achieved and I think that also links to the to the question of planning uh, horizons because uh, the more you have a collective view uh, the easier it is to uh, have the same uh, planning once you have the political changes happening so um, what we could have done was have a final reflection from everyone. But I, I, I just wonder if sometimes you take away what you hear right at the end, right? And I really think it's really important that you take away the, the range of those questions and answers and the presentations that we've got and start to form your own view. What we're seeking is an increasingly more resilient world in the face of huge challenges. and you're all going to be part of the solution if we can all start to get common papers, purpose and work together. And I think that's what we're going to be trying to seek as we go to New York. Could you all thank the speakers? Could you all thank our excellent <laughs> MC? Uh, could you thank the contributors to the work? I think uh, the work that we've done uh, is reflected by a few people, but there's a huge group of people being involved in this. Uh, everyone involved, on, who's been up. involved, stand up, come on. And Diego, that includes you. Come on, stand up. And 
and, and I want you to commit. We don't kick any more footballs into long grass. It, we need action. Thanks very much. Thank you.